Hi, and welcome to the Ready for Love podcast with Anae Oret, the dating and relationship advice show dedicated to helping you create a single life you love, date with confidence and ease, and ultimately attract the love of your life. Thank you for listening. Hello and welcome to the Ready for Love podcast. You're here with me, your host, Anna Orit, dating and relationship coach. And I'm really so excited about introducing today's very special guest to you. And I've really been looking forward to this interview for weeks now. So my guest today is Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. And Karen is a psychologist, author, speaker and musician. She holds a master's degree in clinical psychology and a doctorate in developmental psychology. She spent the early portion of her career as a psychotherapist for children in Chicago's child welfare system and then stepped into academia for 10 years. Her areas of expertise include identity cultivation, authenticity, dating, single living, marriage and adult family dynamics. Karen's book, Single is the New Black, Don't Wear White Till It's Right, inspires singles to remain true to themselves as they navigate their way through the dating jungle. Karen encourages us to make it happen by creating the best version of ourselves and refusing to settle in love or life. She shares both relationship experience and wisdom gleaned from her 27 years on the dating scene, while also giving us inspiration in the fact that she refused to settle and eventually met and married the one. And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today, the very important topic of settling. So what does it really mean? Why do we do it? How do we know we do it? And at the end, Karen will give us four key takeaways to help us figure out our next steps if we suspect we're going down the route of settling. So Karen, thank you so, so much for being here with us today and for spending this time with us. And it's absolutely wonderful to welcome to you to the Ready for Love podcast. You're welcome, Anne. And thank you for the invitation. I'm looking forward to our conversation. <laughs> So we are going to talk about settling, which I think can be a really emotive word when it comes to dating and relationships. And it's a very big premise of of your, your book and of the work that you do and your message. But how about we just dive right in? And I want to ask you, what is your definition how would you describe settling when it comes to dating and love and relationships? It's, it is, it's, it's such, it's very emotive. It's very, it's touchy because we get a lot of messages from friends, family, and very well-intentioned people when it comes to dating. And they might set us up and they say, well, you know, he does this and this and this, and you do this and this and this. So you're a perfect match. And then you go on that date and there's just no chemistry and yet you, you think, well, but on paper, he's a great catch. And, and, and we, we seem to, we appear to have all this in common. And so you try to force it. And, and so to my mind, when we're talking about settling and dating, it's when we're trying to kind of conjure up the feelings that we know we want to have and we, we believe we should have with a romantic partner. <laughs> and and we're, we're working kind of hard to make that happen, but it's not. And sometimes we listen to those messages from those around us and we find ourselves stepping into a relationship and staying with it for a long, long time. And it's, as we've been talking about in, in my bio, like I did that for many, many years on the dating scene and in fact, almost married the wrong person because I was listening to all those messages and not listening to my inner voice. Oh, I think there's so many of us and absolutely me included that can absolutely relate. Yeah. Yeah. To, to what you're saying and, and you just touched on something that I think is so, so important when you said um, your inner voice. Yes. So 
and you just mentioned, you know, that that you've gone through that. Do you do you mind just sharing a little bit about your story when when you found yourself in that situation and how you actually got to the point of knowing that this wasn't right for you? Yes, uh, absolutely. Because I think that's so helpful. Because whether someone, uh, whether a listener has gone through something similar to my story, or something that that is. Uh, very, very similar or, or different. I, I think there'll be room for them to connect with it. Um, yeah. So I was, like you mentioned, I was dating for forever. <laughs> you know, I had the, the typical story, you know, I had boyfriends in college and, and then post-college, I, you know, I had a, a real rough breakup with the boyfriend that um, I had at my final years in college and then kind of had a dry spell. And so I started really doubting myself because I'm in my late twenties now and many of my friends are married and now starting to have children. And I started doubting myself, like mm. believing maybe I was doing something wrong instead of believing the, the other option, which is it's the, the right person just hasn't crossed my path yet. But when you're alone for a period of time, and again, like we've talked about a few minutes ago, the messages that you're hearing, it's very easy to, like I said, start doubting yourself. So then on my 30th birthday, which these milestone birthdays can be, mm. We, yeah, we have to be careful how we how we approach them because we can <laughs> they can just that thirty and and then you look at where you are and are you where you hope to be and if you're not then you can again become vulnerable or susceptible to starting to go down a path that's not right for you. So that's what happened with me. I met a really really great guy on my thirtieth birthday in downtown Chicago. My girlfriends and I were out at a club and I met a guy super nice. Mm -hmm. super smart, super charming, kind, driven, motivated, uh, a catch by any anybody's definition. But I will be honest from the beginning, it wasn't the type of type of guy that I would necessarily feel drawn to or romantically attracted to. But now I've been doubting myself. Yeah. Now there's been mm -hmm. several years where mm -hmm. there's been a dry spell in the dating scene for me. And so I step into a relationship thinking, you know what? Maybe what I'm hoping to feel isn't realistic at 30. Maybe that's what you feel at 15. You know, maybe Disney has sold us a, a, a lie about what we're supposed to feel because of the Disney princesses and this romance and this happily ever after. Yeah. And it's all, it's, it's all phony. And, and I'm, I'm holding out for something that doesn't exist. So I proceeded to date him. And again, I, nothing against him. Great guy, just not my guy. But I proceeded to date him for three years, get engaged now at 33, plan a wedding for uh, May, uh, when I was turning 34 and then started to initially in the engagement period, I was just all into it. I got my bridal magazines and I, here I go. Finally, my turn. I was always the bridesmaid. Now I'm the bride and just had a ball until the calendar turns. And now it's January of, of, of 2004. And I'm supposed to be getting married in May and for some reason that <laughs> when it wasn't a year off, right. when that was, that was a safe distance for the marriage to be a year off and I could still play being the bride and have fun wearing my ring and have my, my engagement party and all these fun things. Mm -hmm. And then when it became four months away, that's when I started freaking out. And I'll, I'll, I'll share this story because I think it's pretty powerful yes, and I'm sure some yes. listeners mm -hmm. have, have experienced this. I, so it was Valentine's day of, of, 2004 and I'm supposed to get married in May. So a couple months away and I'm looking around this beautiful Italian restaurant in Chicago and I'm seeing what you would see on Valentine's day, all these couples romantic. They're looking into each other's eyes and there I am with my fa my fiance, supposedly the love of my life. And I'm looking in his eyes and I'm going, wow, I don't feel what I should be feeling. And I'm looking across the room and I'm jealous of all the other couples. Gosh. And I, yeah. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I shouldn't be jealous. I have a wedding. I have my dream wedding coming up in a couple months. I've got the ring on my finger. I've got this wonderful man sitting in front of me, devoting his life to me. Mm -hmm. And I'm jealous of these other people. And I limped along for another month or so. And then it was right before my first shower. And I can't tell you, I, I've interviewed a lot of, of other runaway brides. <laughs> because My next book is going to be about this experience because I think it's really important. We don't have a lot of resources available in the self-help literature for how to, I mean, there's a lot of resources for how to have the perfect wedding and pick the perfect flowers and pick the perfect dresses for your bridesmaids. But there's not a lot uh, out there to help you really unpack your emotional experience as you are as, as, as you are, uh, 
engage. Mm -hmm. And so um, I've interviewed a lot of runaway brides and there's always one watershed moment, one moment where they just, whether it was the invitations are about to go out or they're about to you know, put on their dress for their final fitting. And for me, it was, I couldn't, I couldn't attend my first shower. I, 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 I imagine myself opening all these gifts and all these wonderful women who love me and support me being so thrilled for me and me knowing that I was living a lie. Gosh, and I'm so, holding my breath, Karen. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. It's, bring it, you know, it's been many years, but, but when I tell it, when I, you know, have the space to tell mm. it, I myself get like, my heart starts racing because th- by that time, I mean, now we're two months away and it's, and deposits have been put down and people have bought plane tickets to fly in and the pastor's ready and the band is ready. And it, it was the, the train was moving down the tracks. Mm-hmm. And at the time I felt like a failure. I felt like, how could I have lied to myself so long? I'm a psychologist, by the way, <laughs> I, should, I should be a little bit more clear about what way. I'm doing. Yes. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So it was right before my, my, my first shower and I just couldn't do it. And then I had the most wonderful maid of honor. I, we were having dinner and the the actual moment was her looking at me and she kept trying to get me to get the shoes because we hadn't picked out the bridesmaid's shoes. And I kept wanting to tell her about all these parties I was going to and all these, like, I just wanted to talk about anything else except the wedding. Right. And she looked at me and she said, Karen, this wedding is in two months and I'm your maid of honor. And it's my job to help you make these final decisions. And you are derailing. You are just like bouncing from any topic except the wedding. And it was like one of those things where I finally, like she held up a mirror in front of me to show me who I was in that moment. Mm-hmm. And I looked at her and I go, Heather, I, I don't, I, I, I can't do this. I, and she was like, I don't think you can. And then of course, tears and sobbing and just in the midst of like an enormous amount of pain. But also I have to say there was that little bit of relief because I finally was being true to myself. I've got goosebumps. <laughs> Do, at what moment, since we're talking about settling um, specifically, but was that part of your your truth at the time then that you you made that connection that this is what was happening, and that that is that is was in fact what you would be doing if you continued and got married and potentially then had a family down the line and so on? That's a great question because I think at the moment it didn't feel like settling per se. Mm -hmm. I had just, I had just constructed a world in my mind to make that choice okay. And the way I constructed the world was that, as I said earlier, all those desires of that trying to find the one, which is why I talk about my husband now as the one, because I thought that I thought that, well, there isn't just one soulmate for you. And I'm not saying there is necessarily, but I had decided that it was perfectly reasonable to walk down the aisle with a good enough guy. Mm -hmm. And that didn't, I wouldn't have framed it as like, I'm settling. Cause like I said, he's a great guy. And I'm very careful to always say that when I share this or when I write about it in my blog, or when I, when I share stories about this on my podcast, because I would never want to take away from him. And that's the other thing that I want listeners to understand. Settling doesn't mean that this person's not a great person. It's just not for you. You don't have that chemistry, that energy, that Zaza Zoo, as Carrie called it in Sex in the City. Mm -hmm. So, So to your point on it, no, at the moment, I wasn't thinking of settling. I was just fighting a world that I had decided. I had decided in my head that it's perfectly fine to end up with a good enough guy because he's good enough and he'll be good father and he's driven and he's motivated and he's successful and he'll take care of you. And that's all anybody can really ask for anyway. So I decided that I'd set a lower bar rather than shooting for true love, rather than shooting for that, that heart beating faster and that, that, you know, weak in the knees. I I decided that that, that that probably was unavailable to most of us. And most of us just have to go with a good enough guy. I have got so many questions that are going through my head right now. I need to just calm down my brain. <laughs> so 
you said this happened to you when you were like around your 30s. So, yes. Um, and a big part of the reason why I wanted to talk to you about this is um, obviously, you know, you've since moved on and you're very happily married to your one person. Yes. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll come on to, to how that happened in, in just a little bit as well. But um, most of my clients and a large part of my demographic are actually kind of around their late th- late thirties, early forties. Um, have never been married, or mm-hmm. have come out of, um, and they still want to to do that. Um, or they've come out of long term relationships, and you know, going through that that process, or coming out of divorces, you know, and they're in their forties. But I also have some clients who are fifty, early fifties, who have never been married and really would still like that you know they still want to do that and I just wondered if you in in your experience what are some of those um pressures that you see people go through I think earlier you talked about kind of the external pressures through um you know listening to other people's opinions and, and that kind of thing but in in your experience those internal pressures almost that's happening inside us as we go through this process and and we feel this just hasn't happened for us and and time is becoming a factor as well what would you say to somebody like that who's listening to us at the moment yeah that is there are a lot of pressures and they are internal as well I I mean, we're biologically primed. We're social creatures. I mean, this is, you know, I'm a psychologist, not an anthropologist, but you look at cultures worldwide and marriage and pairing up is part of every culture. So it's very natural to want that desire. And so, and I, and I do believe it's internal for most of us. You know, there's a few you know, rare people that are perfectly happy, single for forever, and that's wonderful. Mm-hmm. But for most of us, we desire that lifelong partner. And so... And I think we, like we were saying, there's so many messages. Sometimes, you know, women get told, you know, we should be Ms. Independent. We don't need a man. And I don't need anybody. I'm just going to focus on my career. And, and that's great too. But sometimes I would feel guilty in my, in my thirties that, you know, after I called off the wedding, now I'm 34 back on the dating scene yet again. Mm -hmm. And I would feel guilty sometimes because I still had that desire. And uh, I, where I didn't question my decision. I mean, initially I felt like a train wreck and I felt, like I said earlier, I felt guilty. I'd, I'd ruined, I felt like I'd ruined his life and I disappointed my friends and family. And, and, and really everyone at the time was telling me, you were courageous, Karen. That was so hard to do. And they were giving me like big thumbs up, but I couldn't hear that at the moment. I couldn't receive that. Right. But looking back, I know that it was the courageous thing to do. And so I didn't doubt my decision with, within six months. Mm-hmm. I, I would say that I'd really owned my decision, but I still have that desire. And then of course, every year that goes by, there are the comments from, like I said earlier, well-intentioned friends and family. And then my mom is getting stuff from her friends. Like, why isn't Karen married yet? She's 38. What's going on with her? And, Mm -hmm. and so forth. And so it can be very demoralizing. And what I would say though, to your listeners, like you're saying is, and I found this from my own experience, you know, obviously when I caught off my wedding, I had to look myself and I did like literally not just figuratively. I literally looked myself in the mirror. I remember one morning and I, I looked at myself in the mirror. And I said, Karen, this may be your last chance. No one else may ever ask you to marry him. You may never be able to be a mother. And that's something that like most women I'd always anticipated would be part of my, my journey. Mm-hmm. And I had to, I had to know that for me, I would rather take the chance to not be married and not be a mother, but to not live a lie and to wait for the hope that there was that perfect partner, not perfect person, but perfect partner for me, that perfect connection that I was hoping for Mm -hmm. that I, I had to make that decision. Now I'm not saying everyone would make that decision. People, you know, like I said, I've interviewed a lot of one way brides, but I've also interviewed people who got divorced and most of them, because I call them the wish I'd run away brides. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Most of them say that down deep, they knew on their wedding day, or if not before, that they were making the wrong decision, but they had other realities that they stepped into. They thought, I'll make it work, or I can't hurt him. He's such a good guy. He loves me so much. Or, 
you know, there's things that aren't perfect, but we'll, we'll make it happen. We'll, we'll, we'll read the books and, and we'll go to marriage seminars. You know, they had figured out a way to talk themselves into it. Mm-hmm. And you I know that, into one of those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah. 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 So many. Mm-hmm. So what I would share is that what I chose was what I knew was right for me. And I understand where people step into another path. But most of them, like you're saying, and like from your experience, most of them end up eventually having to get out of it anyway. Mm -hmm. So to someone who's in their late 40s, 50s, even 60s, I would suggest that the option to settle isn't really an option. Mm -hmm. I would just argue we think it's an option because we think, well, I could just be with someone and call it a day and just check off that box off my list of things I'm supposed to do in adulthood. But I don't think that they would be happy and fulfilled. So what they're hoping for isn't available to them until it's available to them. And it's not available to them in the form of settling. And I would submit also, and I'm sure you can echo this, and and I'm sure your clients are frustrated, but they also feel proud of the strength and courage it takes to live a solo independent life. Mm -hmm. And that that's better than living a fake life. And that also I would suggest from having been single for so much of my adult life, I can tell you that everything I did to learn to make myself happy on my own just makes me a better wife now Mm -hmm. because I don't look to my husband to fulfill me. I know that's my job. God and I fulfill me every day. Mm -hmm. And he's just icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have to prop me up or make me feel okay about myself. We're just two fulfilled people partnering hand in hand throughout life. And that's something that is a gift to your future spouse by, by owning that part of your journey solo. So that would be what I would say to, to your listeners in that, in that situation. However long it takes. Right. Yeah. So for somebody like me, and I know <clears throat> some, some, of, some of those who will be listening to us, like you said, have come through long-term relationships and divorces and by far the majority of people that I've spoken to and and myself included did know deep down that something wasn't right yes and um, in my case it was certain red flags around pretty big things and um, I still went ahead and Mm -hmm. got into a marriage and, and those things just became worse over the years and resulted, you know, in a divorce. Mm. And so my question really is, why are we so good at overriding at, at mm-hmm. our intuition sometimes, mm-hmm. or very often, actually? And I just wondered your thoughts about that. What? Because also, I wasn't 19. I was, by the time I got married the first time, I was 30. So Mm -hmm. I thought I knew what I was doing, but clearly I was still on so many levels and even subconsciously on some levels overriding myself. And I I just wondered about your your thoughts on on not listening to our gut feelings and not paying enough attention to ourselves and our intuition. Yes, (laughs) I I, I love this topic because, and, and that's why I share my story because you're right on a so many women have done this, have, have just like you said, they let their, 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 whatever kind of reality they've constructed override their gut, even when they know, and the red flags are waving and they just dismiss them, dismiss them. They put on blinders and just shoot for the, the finish line as if then everything will sort itself out in the end. And it won't. No, <laughs> we know this. No, it won't. And, oh, it will, I, but, but in a different way, you, you'll probably right. end up with a, yeah, going down the breakup or divorce route, most of right. Them. Mm-hmm. And and I and I to your question, why I think it's because we just start to absorb those messages from from the the exterior, from the pop culture. We and and again, and so I, what I love about this question is, what do we do about it? And mm-hmm, mm-hmm. one of my my mottos in life is take charge of your thoughts, take charge of your life. And when we allow our thoughts to go into these directions of, well, maybe this is as good as it gets, or, well, you know, I'm turning 30 and, and just, I don't want to be 
the, the only single woman in my group of friends as if that matters. Like who cares? <laughs> you, know? Do you know, like we allow realities to have meaning or we don't, it's our decision. You know, I had to say to myself, okay, I'm 34 and single, but so what? I live in Chicago. There's like a million single people. Why do I think that's a thing? I allow it to be a thing or I don't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We take control of the meaning of our perceptions and our realities. And it's our job to harness it. Because if we don't harness it, then these other voices start to chatter and they start to take up space and they start to win the battle. Mm -hmm. And, and to your point, that and that's how we, we we allow our gut that's kicking and screaming and saying, I don't want this life. I know this isn't right, but I'm just so scared. And we allow fear to grip us. And, and what happened for me, and I'm so thankful, is that I finally realized I was more scared of living a phony life and a phony marriage than I was being single again. Right, right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We let that fear become the foundation for our decisions. And that's just a horrible way to live life. Yeah. It's, it, it's, 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 it just gives me the shivers to think about how many fear-based decisions we make. So I think that's when that fear grips us, that's what pushes our intuition away. So it's either the fear of not having what you really, really want and then still going ahead with something that you know in your soul is not right for you, all the fear of leaving that and are you going to still be okay and are you going to get another chance and is something somebody else going to come along and is it going to be better and kind of so it's very much also stepping away from a some sort of comfort zone almost to to leave a relationship that's not quite what it should be or even a um being engaged like in your case right oh those are really really <laughs> big things aren't they <laughs> right because you're right there is comfort mm. in what is known and that can be powerful too mm -hmm. because you know some people will say what is it the expression i don't know it's the the devil you know versus the devil you don't know yep. and so i think sometimes people go well you know he's 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 not perfect but he's my guy and he'll do And who knows, I could get a guy that's worse if I take the chance of leaving this guy. And maybe the next relationship will be worse. And, and, and you know, I called off my wedding at 34 and didn't meet my husband until 40. So I had another six years of, of ups and downs and a, and a horrible heartbreak at 36 that mm -hmm. dragged on into my late 30s. And, and then other relationships that were good and good enough and on paper should have been perfect. So, again, I hit the same experience with multiple more relationships where I had to walk away from something that was comfortable and could have worked. I mean, mm -hmm. it could have worked, Yeah. but I'm so glad I just held out for the, the brass ring. I just held out for the best. And, and that's why I'm so passionate and, and so excited to have the opportunity to share this stuff because it's not easy to unpack all those dueling message and the, the battle that wages in our minds. Mm -hmm. How did you do it, Karen? How did you, uh -uh. how did you keep the faith in something that you had a sense of? It sounds like deep, deep inside, but it was nothing concrete. It was nothing you could ever hold. It wasn't something you could see. But how did you keep the faith in what you have now? And how did you keep saying no to no? This is not what I want. How did you? How did you keep the faith? that it's going to happen? Yeah, that's a great question. It was a combination of, like I said, realizing that watershed moment. And I'll bring in the topic of authenticity here, knowing that Karen can't do life living a lie. And I'm not saying people are intentionally like, I'm going to live a lie today. <laughs> you know, I, no. I, I, just, I, I don't mean to minimize that everyone else is lying to themselves and fine with it. But what I mean is that I realized that I, I wanted this and that I knew that if I never got it, I, I'd be okay because I'd rather hold out the hope for something really magical and wonderful or be a happy single person and, 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 and no, that wasn't my life, life, life's desire or my life's plan. And I never expected to be 42 when I got married. That seemed way too late you know, to my mind. <laughs> I didn't want to be that old when I got married, but I, 
I want, I, I realized that for me, there was no way it was either I would get that or I wouldn't. And I would be a happy single person thriving in my career writing. I was a professor at the time. I would continue to impact my nieces and nephews, my family. I would live a full, full life in all these other realms, hoping for the one to show up. But if not, I'd be okay. And it was also just that faith that that was out there because I saw it every once in a while. And I think you'd agree. I mean, we look around us, we don't always see that many happy marriages. I mean, that was another thing, not to be cynical, but that part of me was like, listen, I'm aspiring to something that I don't see that many people getting right. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to step into being one of the masses who have these mediocre connections and call it marriage. I'm going to either just keep living this really full and, and happy single life, hoping that the one is going to show up eventually. And if not, I'm going to be okay. And it was faith also in God. I mean, honestly, I really was like, God, we're going to be okay. <laughs> you know, I, you're, I, 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 don't, I, I, of course I had moments of feeling alone from time to time. I didn't have that utter loneliness because I, I filled myself up with a connection to God, with a connection to my friends and family. I had very intense relationships, which is another side topic, but a beautiful thing that single, you know, that girl power thing, there's a very beautiful thing with of your, your, your cadre of single ladies where you, f you fill that emotional void as you are in the process of your ins and outs of relationships and, and cheering each other on and hoping that each other eventually meets that special person. Mm -hmm. So I, I just looked for that emotional fulfillment in other places and, and yeah, I, I hope that answers your question. It's, it's a great question, Anae. I've never really had anyone ask me that in that exact way. Mm -hmm. Well, I just, you know, when I think about it, it's um, there's just so much that goes into having such a strong sense of yourself and the vision that you have for your life and not, <laughs> excuse me, compromising on that and... Um, and that's really the starting point of everything, isn't it? Because that strong sense of self and your authenticity, I would imagine, was a huge part of what then attracted your now husband. Mm -hmm. Would that be would that be accurate? Yes, I would. I would completely agree with you. The way I put it, my husband was married before, and we met shortly after he divorced. He was married twenty three years. And so at first I thought, gosh, she's recently divorced and I'm a psychologist. I'm like, whoa, I'm going to be a rebound girl here. You know, I was a little gun shy because he was so fresh back into the dating scene after 23 years. And I thought, gosh, we have had just completely different lives. He got married in his early twenties. I'm 40 and still single. You know, I thought <laughs> what, what we, you know, I live in the city. He lives in the suburbs. How are we ever going to have any common ground? But what we learned pretty quickly was that he had been in a marriage that wasn't working for uh, quite a while, but he stayed with it as many people do because of the children. Mm. And I had been unlucky in love for quite a while, but had remained happy and hopeful and positive. And so I thought, gosh, really, it's not the circumstances. It's just the attitude. It's the mindset that we both refuse to be defeated by circumstances that were unfortunate and, and, and very disappointing and hurtful, but we refuse to be defeated by those. Mm -hmm. and, and so we came together with that commonality. And I will say, Ani, I, I think I should say that late 20s dry spell that I experienced after a very def, uh, very difficult breakup in with my last boyfriend in college, and I alluded to it earlier in our conversation, those were some dark days for me. And that's where I I, like I said, I started really doubting myself, wondering what was wrong with me. I, that authenticity that you speak of, it was something I had to battle to get. I had to duke it out with myself, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And there were some dark days where I let my my normal, happy, positive self slip slip to the wayside, mm -hmm. where I would have days of, de of depression and darkness and fearing that I'd be alone for forever. And like we talked about earlier, then thinking, well, if I'm, if I'm alone for, for forever, what does that mean about me? That I'm unlovable, that I'm unworthy, mm -hmm. that, that somehow my parents screwed up, even though I have these great parents that seem to do this great job, but somehow what's wrong with me? <laughs> you know, so I, those, those years of battling that and then taking back. And as you can see from the trajectory of my life, you know, at 30, I'm stepping into the wrong relationship. 
for three years and then a year of engagement. You know, so it took a long time yeah. for me to finally go, no, my life, I choose the meaning my life has. And if I'm alone, so what? It means nothing unless I decide it means something. It doesn't mean I'm lovable. It just means that I'm strong enough and courageous enough to wait for something spectacular. So it's a lot, like I, I said earlier, taking charge of your thoughts and your perspective. Mm-hmm. That's really the only thing we can, can control in this life when you think about it. And you're the only one that can do that, right? For yourself. Absolutely. 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 So this is the next level question that I just have for you because um, I just wonder then, because we're, we're talking about this from a single perspective. And mm-hmm. so I've been married before. It's both Neil and I, you know, it's our second marriages. Um, I also started over in my mid thirties because you know, by the time, <laughs> by the time I thought I was going to have everything in place and hitting my stride on every level of my life, I was back to zero. Um, so I was literally right. starting over career, relationship, you know, divorced, single, all, all those kind of things. Um, so then got into a new relationship and, and all that. But I'm just thinking, if there's anybody out there that's actually listening, that's in a long-term relationship now, they're not still leading up to something, but, you know, they've been with somebody for a long time and or they might even be married. How do you distinguish between feeling like you've settled for the person you're with or that maybe as it happens in long-term relationships, that things are might just be a little bit stale and so much of long-term relationships as kind of periods of kind of maybe a bit being a bit bored, but bring it back again. Or what are your, your thoughts around that when you're actually in a relationship? How do you distinguish between those different things? Well, I love the concept of not settling in marriage. Mm-hmm. And there's no question, I was talking to my brother about this a couple of years ago, and there's no question when you have children and their needs and, and the relationship can stop being the priority, which is really troubling. And actually family systems theory, which uh, my dissertation is in family systems uh, theory and therapy. We look at the family and we know that the marriage has to be at the top of the hierarchy. It has to have the most attention. And people struggle with this because when they become parents, which is another subsystem of the family, two people, usually the same people are the married married partners and the parents, but it's easy to give so much attention to the children and then let the spouse relationship kind of dwindle. And so I would encourage like a first checkpoint if you're in a long-term relationship is to just ask yourself, wait a minute, have I just let some things slip? Am I not dating my spouse anymore? Mm-hmm. And and I, some of these cliches, they sound kind of corny, but they're powerful. Like mm-hmm. remember the enthusiasm you had when you first went out on dates and how you would get your hair just so and you put on the cutest little outfit. Like doesn't your spouse deserve the same energy that you gave to someone who was kind of a stranger when you first started dating each other? <laughs> you know, so I would encourage people to examine, am, is, is it settling or have I just let the, the spark dwindle? And if it's just that the spark is dwindling, there's no reason not to revive that flame mm-hmm. and it will take some intention. And that's why I love little pithy, like date your spouse, like yeah. date them, you know, listen to them. And there's a ton of research on marriage that looks at even just, um, Turning toward, there's uh, research by the Gottmans. You're probably familiar with them. Yeah. They have a marriage institute. And they talk about like little things. They watch couples interact. And when a, a, they call them bid for attention. And it's so easy. So you can imagine the morning you both have your coffee. You're reading the paper. You're online. And your husband says, oh, you know, look at this. Uh, listen to this. And you're like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because you're, 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 you're like involved with your story that you're reading or your article that you're reading. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, and so little things like putting down your paper or your magazine or your laptop and turning towards your husband and going, yeah, what do you want to share with me? Mm -hmm. Little things on a little things can bring back that enthusiasm. Now, if you're married and you realize you've settled because that's a reality too, then you have to look at, 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 are there kids? And then you may want to stay in the marriage for the sake of the children, which some people frown upon. But I think as long as there's not overt uh, abuse and, and, and violence, 
the kids, they do benefit from that stability. So you may want to kind of wait it out and be as kind and polite to your spouse as you can. And then when the kids launch, then you go for your next chapter. And, and many people do that because they realize I got married at 20 and I didn't know who I was and he didn't know who he was. And then we had a couple of kids. And, and so let's wait this out for the sake of the kids and then we'll, we'll, we'll move on. Um, if you're in a long-term relationship without marriage, then I think you have some freedom as long as there aren't children involved, there aren't other people's lives being profoundly impacted. Then, you know, obviously I'm not a fan for staying in a relationship. You know, as I've been sharing, I was with my ex fiance four years. And, mm-hmm. and, and like I said, like you, I was, no baby. <laughs> but so I don't think that there's, if there's any, it doesn't, who, who cares? Because sometimes people, and I did too, I think I put so much time into this. I can't chuck it now. I can't leave it now. This is, I've invested oh, so much. Of my one, life. Isn't it? Isn't yeah. it? Huge. It's, mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. And I would it's think sometimes it's got to work out because I put so much time into it. But I would argue yeah, you put so much time into it. Let's not waste another day. <laughs> I just, I would reframe that. Let's look at this from another you're, angle. You're all for the different perspective, aren't you? <laughs> yes, it's so free. So important, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, gosh, I, I do have plenty more questions. I'm just keeping an eye on the time, Karen. <laughs> right. So, in your, in your experience then, with... Um, with people that actually go into successful marriages, do you see any kind of themes, or maybe the top two or three things that, that people do do, you know, kind of in inverted commas, right, whatever that may be? What are the kind of success factors to make that transition between being with that person and then transitioning into a successful relationship in your experience since you've you've done that you've done the work you were by yourself you've been through everything you've gone through and now you are happily married what are what are some of the key things you think we should we, we should think about and that we can uh, follow your example on as yeah as i said before i think the best position you are best positioned for a happy marriage when you are happy yourself single. Mm. I put it this way. Happy singles make happy marriages. Yeah. And I think, like, as I said, all the work you do prepares you to be a great spouse because you're not coming from a position of I'm needy and I'm so happy you're around and you're my spouse because now I don't feel lonely. Mm -hmm. That's not a good reason to get married. Mm -hmm. (laughs) To fill your void is not a good reason to get married. Mm -hmm. That puts you in a position of having an unhealthy dynamic in the, in the marriage. And there's also an imbalance of power when you think about it, because if I need you so desperately to feel okay about myself Mm -hmm. and feel okay about my existence, if I need you, then I'm giving you way too much power and that's not healthy. And, 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 and we don't want to give that much power, even to our spouse. And, and people really bristle against this notion of power in healthy relationships. But there's always a power balance. And it's always a back and forth. Mm-hmm. And and so I I I remember I dated a guy in my 20s during that, that dry spell. There was a couple guys that were around for a couple months. <laughs> and I remember one. And I remember even at that point, I started clarifying the notion that I wanted to be with someone who wanted to be with me and who I wanted to be with. I did not want to be with someone who needed me or that I needed because then that's not a choice. Yeah. It's because I have to, it's out of desperation. And I remember him saying, no, I just want to be with someone who needs me like to live. And I thought, no, I'm going the opposite direction with this. (laughs) I want to be with someone who wants me because then my husband, he could, he had the pick of the litter. I mean, he had the, he could have picked anyone. He's wonderful. And he could have had anyone. Mm-hmm. And he picked me, not because he needed someone to make him feel okay about himself, but he picked me because he wanted me. That's mm-hmm. so much more powerful to yeah. start a, a relationship, to my mind. That's my first thought. Um, and a couple others, I think also just like we've talked about as well, just making sure that you keep things fresh. And that sounds kind of cliche, but just maintain the enthusiasm. 
And that's easy for me because I was single for so long. So I'm, I mean, I'm thrilled when he helps me with the groceries because I was living in Chicago, dragging my groceries up three flights of steps and a walk up, you know, in the city. I'm like, oh, wait, someone's got muscles around here and he's going to help me. Yay. You know, so it's very easy for me to be very starry eyed still because of all those periods of, of being by myself. I just appreciate the help. It's easy for me to maintain that appreciation and that sense of excitement. Yeah. So I, I think the way the way you date a very large part of those <clears throat> dynamics and patterns that get set up between in your little in your little world, your little universe between two people that's so unique um, that sets the, the relationships for so much of your your future, doesn't it? Oh, and for if, sure. If it's not healthy. Um, right from the dating part, it's not going to change just because you're married. Oh, no. And, and you <laughs> no. see that over and over. Um, sure. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much. I just have to ask, and I'm sure anybody who's listening, would you mind just sharing with us, um, how did you meet your husband? How did that oh. happen? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I use a dating service. Right. Yeah. So I was meeting, like I said, lots of people just not finding that connection. Mm -hmm. And as I was a professor at the time, and so, and uh, yeah, I had a small little department of colleagues at the university, but it was one of those things. I wasn't in a, a field where I was running into new people all the time. Mm -hmm. And so I used a dating service that we have, I believe it's over in the UK as well. Um, it's called, it's just lunch. Oh, and yeah. it was nice because they, you know, the online thing can work for some people. Um, but what I liked about this was that they made the arrangements. So they would call me and say, Karen, are you available Saturday night? I'd say, sure. I'll, you, know, it's, you have drinks or, or lunch. And, and the, the premise is you can like, have that drink for, you know, 45 minutes. And if you're not feeling connection, you know, no harm, no foul, you can take off mm -hmm. without feeling like a jerk. You know, it's meant to be just a small amount of time. And then, of course, if you're enjoying each other, then you can oh, well, let's have dinner as well. But I liked yeah. that it was kind of like, you know, I can get out if this yeah, is yeah, a, yeah. a bad <laughs> important, important, yeah. Yeah, and they set it up, so that was nice too. So they would mm -hmm. just, I would go to the hostess stand at the restaurant and say, I have a 7 o'clock reservation, I'm here to meet Dan, and then the hostess would take me to the table, as opposed to like walking into Starbucks and like, okay, the guy said he was going to be wearing a red ball cap and, mm -hmm. you know, a green mm -hmm. shirt. You know, you're kind of looking around, are, are you Joe? <laughs> So I kind of liked the structure of it. Right. And when you met him, was it love at first sight or did it take a while? It was definitely chemistry right away. He has a beautiful, warm smile and these lovely light blue eyes that were very, very striking. Mm -hmm. And um, he's, he's, a, a gr he's such a sensitive, amazing conversationalist. He's in sales and I'm a psychologist. So at first I was like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> it's like, who's analyzing who? You know, I thought this could be a little weird. But um, no, it was definitely a very strong connection. In fact, our date, you know, I said, it's just drinks. Um, we started at seven and that date didn't wrap up till 2.30 <laughs> in the morning because um, in Chicago, the bars stay open till three o'clock on Saturday night. So mm -hmm. we, yeah, we closed out the, the second bar we went to. And so we obviously had so much in common, but you know, uh, it wasn't love at first sight in the sense that, like I said, he was recently divorced mm -hmm. and that concerned me. Uh, he had children and I thought, oh my, this is something different. And they were, they were older. Like his youngest was in eighth grade, I think at the time. And his oldest was in college, but it was still, that was another variable I had to wrap my mind around. Like, can I be a stepmom? This is a, uh, this is a role I didn't anticipate for my life. So sure. because of just the realities of adulting, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, I wouldn't say it was love at first sight, but we definitely had a very strong connection. And mm -hmm. uh, we met in August. And then by January, throughout the fall, we were dating other people and just, you know, living our lives and being just just dating the way you do. Mm -hmm. And then by January, we decided to be exclusive. And then the that following July, we were engaged. So it was pretty quick. Mm -hmm. um, after we became exclusive, it was pretty clear that we had something really extraordinary. And he put it, he, he said, I wasn't going to let you back out there to get someone stuffed up by some other guy, which felt really wonderful. And I, of course, had been out there long enough to know, okay, there's some things that we'll work on, you know, recently divorced, uh, kids, all these things. Sure. But I, I knew enough about him at that point to, to know I can trust him to have my back and to be on my side. 
I know what life's about with challenges and so forth. And I can trust him to meet me and to be my support through those challenges. So when you were engaged the first time, there was a moment that you knew Mm -hmm. that this was not going to be right. And you were Mm -hmm. holding out for something extraordinary, Mm -hmm. something different that you knew was out there and you believed it would be. So when you met Dan, was there a moment which, when you knew, okay, this was it, this is, this is what I've been holding out for all this time, this is why I've been through everything I've been through and left everything that I've left and walked away from relationships and this is it. Was there a moment yeah. like that? Yes, yes, there was a moment Um, And I won't, it wasn't even when we were engaged though. It was, so I, as I mentioned in January, we became exclusive in December, we were having a date and he was bringing up uh, new year's Mm -hmm. and he said, Hey, I'm free for new year's. And are you, and there's a little bit of backstory to this. Um, I was always, my family's very musical and we would always uh, perform at new year's in Cincinnati, my hometown. Mm -hmm. And um, my father had become ill. And he could, he was the piano player in our little group (laughs) and he was not able to perform anymore. And, uh, but this tradition of going home for new year's might have been a family tradition for like 20 years. And we would all perform together, my, my, my brothers and me and my father. And I, it was very devastating because as you know, I know you've lost your parents as you, Mm. as your parents age, there's, it's very painful. And to have my father not be able to do something that was part of, he was a music professor and a jazz piano player. And for him not to be able to do that was just profoundly mm-hmm. difficult. And I hadn't shared anything, any of this with Dan yet, just hadn't gotten to that point. But so when he asked me to go out for New Year's, I explained to him, Oh, you know, um, yeah, thank you so much, but I'm going to go home to Cincinnati and be with my parents for New Year's. And and then I explained a little bit about my father's illness. And I expected, like most men, I expected he would say, oh, well, that's too bad because I was going to take you out in the town in Chicago. We were going to do it upright with champagne and dancing. And, and you know, well, you know, are you sure you don't want to do that? Because, you know, your parents will be fine. I expect him to try to twist my arm just because i that's what I think most people would do. And he just looked at me and goes, oh, wow, I, I, I can understand you'd want to be there in Cincinnati with your parents. And I mean, if you don't mind, I, I, I would drive down to Cincinnati and we could be with your parents. And then maybe you and I could, you know, go out you know, when they're, when, the, when they want to go to bed and we could go and get a glass of champagne to, to ring in the new year. And I just looked at him like, mm. are you kidding me? Mm. I was like, what? He's going to drive down to Cincinnati to hang out with people in their seventies mm. to be with me. Mm. And I, th- I just, I was like, oh my gosh, this mm. guy. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and it's still wow. Yeah. <laughs> It really is. Oh, I'm so happy for you, Karen. <laughs> Thank you. So um, <clears throat> we're going to be, oh, I can keep talking, um, but we're going to be wrapping up not too long from now. But I know you've got four key takeaway messages to, to share with whoever is listening. And just I, around the whole topic that we discussed around settling. So can you can you share those with us, please, yes. just to our takeaways for today? Yes, definitely. I I love takeaway messages. And here are my four things to ask yourself to be sure you're not settling. And they're A, B, C, and T. So that's how to remember them. A, B, C, and T. Okay. And T. (laughs) Just switch up. No D, it's T. So A, B, C, and T. So the first one is, are you talking yourself into it? And this is something that I've taken from, again, my conversations with other women. And when I hear them talking around the relationship and kind of going, huh, well, I think it'll work. And and you can hear themselves trying to make it a fit, trying to make it a match. And, and it was actually another woman who said, you know, I just think when I hear myself, I'm talking myself into this whole thing. And I remember thinking that's a really nice takeaway. Examine your thoughts. Are you talking yourself into the relationship? Two is be, be your own best friend. Now that sounds really corny, but what would you say to your best friend if she came to you and explained all the dynamics of your relationship and you sensed that she was settling? What would you tell her? 
start telling yourself the same thing. I mean, how can we be so great for our girlfriends mm-hmm. and, and believe in their potential and believe that, that life has nothing but the best for them, but we don't say those same things to ourselves. And so just take a step outside of yourself, come at yourself, approach your situation as your, your best girlfriend would and give yourself that same pep talk. Mm-hmm. Three is C is it. check. <laughs> What's that? Um, go ahead. No, I just I love it. I think we should do it with many more things for ourselves. For sure. sure. This, yeah, this yeah. is just applying to settling. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so three is C, check in with your fears. And we touched on that quite a bit in our conversation. Mm. Are you making a fear-based decision? And be very honest with yourself. And that's where the clarity is. Honesty with yourself is not easy. As you mentioned, we're very good at stuffing our intuition when we want to. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it's because we're scared. Unpack those fears. What are you really scared of? Ask yourself, reframe it like we've been doing throughout this conversation. Are you really that scared of being alone? Are you, you probably should be more scared of, of stepping into a mediocre slash cruddy marriage or relationship, you know, so examine the fears and then challenge them. I'm so scared of being alone for forever. Well, okay, let, let's, let's challenge this. All right. Just cause I'm alone for this week or this month or this year doesn't mean I'm going to be alone forever. That's irrational. Yeah. <laughs> There's a great uh, a field of psychotherapy called REBT, rational emotive behavioral therapy. And the entire therapy is based on challenging your irrational thinking. You just challenge it. You just talk mm-hmm. to yourself the way you, you you debate with yourself. Like, well, that's irrational to think that just because I'm alone right now. It, when, when I was 34 and stepping out of this this supposed to be marriage, just because I'm alone at 44 at 34 does not mean I'm going to be alone at 44. It's irrational to assume that. Yeah. So get very real and rational to fight those fears because fears come from a very emotional place. Use your head to to combat that. And then, so is it is it worth to absolutely go to what is the absolute worst possible thing or situation or scenario that can come out of this and actually work through that? And then can you cope with it? Probably yes, right? Right. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what, what is, is the, the worst, worst that can happen? happen? Just it, it, mentally face that and go, yeah, I can cope with it. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And then for your T, A, B, C, T is trust your gut. And what I love about this is this is the kind of thing that I think, again, women who are career oriented and we've gone to college and we have gotten our graduate degrees and we're very cerebral and we get in our head, which, as I said earlier, can be good at combating our fears. But at the same time, we can't be so cerebral that we start to, as you put it, stuff and, and dismiss our intuition. And there's actually science to back this up. Because when you think about it, your brain and your central nervous system go all the way down your spine, right? So, and there's actually the same neurotransmitters that we have in our brains that are making connections between the, in the synapses of our neural connections. These neurotransmitters are found in our guts as well. They're found in our stomach. So it's perfectly reasonable when we think about butterflies in our tummy, right? Because yeah. we're nervous, which is an emotion, which we think of being as being housed in our mind or in our brain, that's being evidenced we're in manifesting in our belly. And so as you've experienced, you said yourself, as all the women that I interviewed said, deep down they knew. So just take a moment, whether it's yoga or prayer or just centering meditation, do yourself a favor when you're in a position where you're not sure if you're settling or you're afraid you will and give yourself a little space to really check in with your gut. And some people will ask me, well, Karen, wait a minute, because I don't know if I trust my gut because I've been through some trauma or my parents were horrible parents. So I wasn't raised right. How can I, I don't know that I'm emotionally healthy. Can't we only trust our gut if we're emotionally healthy? And to then to that end, I say, then do what it takes. Read your self-help books. Do your journaling, get some psychotherapy, get a dating coach, relationship coach, life coach. Those efforts will help you make, help make yourself more healthy to where you will begin to be able to trust your gut. But even, no matter what's going on with you, I don't, it doesn't matter what you've been through. I think down deep, you still can trust your gut. But if you're worried about that, then take some, take some, uh, make some efforts to get as healthy as you can possible, as you possibly can emotionally. I love it. 
absolutely love it. Thank you so much. Those are four amazing tips that can that you can apply to so many situations anyway. But thank you so, so much for sharing those. Oh, I really enjoyed our conversation, Anne. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been a real treat. Thanks, Karen. It's just flown by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I feel like we can keep going <laughs> for sure. Yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Well, you've said a few things that I um that I would like to to explore with you a little bit further. So hopefully you will come back and join us again in the future because it's been absolutely wonderful to have you. Oh. Absolutely. I will come back anytime. And I want to have you on my podcast as well, Aww. because I, I love synergy and like minds and you're doing such great work for women. And I just want to share that with my listeners as well. Oh, thank you. That means so much to me. <laughs> <laughs> so just before we finish, um, Karen, what, um, you know, anybody who wants to connect with you and so on, I will obviously put all the your your website links and links to your your book and your social media links and so on um, on the show notes for our episode. But um, is there what's new and exciting? What are you working on at the moment? What's happening in your your world that you can share with us? Yeah. So as I mentioned, I have a podcast called yep. Dr. Karen Love and Life. Yes. I don't take on clients right now. I speak. And I uh, do the podcast, obviously, and I'm writing. So my one book, as you mentioned earlier, when you talked about my bio, is um, a word of encouragement and empowerment for singles as they continue to uh, navigate the dating world <laughs> and the jungle that's out there as they're waiting for the one. And then my second book that I mentioned as well that I'm working on will be very uh, reminiscent of everything we talked about today because I, I want to provide a resource for people who are engaged to really take a, a good hard look at their motivations and if they're really in the right <laughs> engagement for the right reason. So that's new and exciting. Um, my podcast, I just started this year. So I am just getting all kinds of different topics on certainly focusing a lot on singles and dating relationships, but also looking at some other parts of life that uh, are exciting. I am really, as you can tell from our conversation, you know, my focus is on the power of your, your mind and your thoughts and how those the, the harnessing that is, is what gives us the ability to step into a, and fully thrive in life. So th those are what I, the things I'm working on right now. And uh, anyone can connect on me. I'd love to hear from any listeners on all my social media channels, which like you said, you're going to make available. Absolutely. So that's great. Thank you. Absolutely. I've listened to some of your podcast episodes and I, I think they're wonderful. You know, oh, thank, thank you. I think, yeah, I just really love your message and, and the way that you, um, that you inspire and teach and encourage. And I think the way that your, your story has come together is really, you know, it's really showing that it, it is worth, it, it is worth waiting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it really is. I know it's, it's not easy to feel that yeah. in the midst of it, but it's, uh, I do hope that, you know, I, I do sometimes worry. I, I want to, show my happily ever after to inspire and encourage, but I also don't want to have someone who's going, well, shoot, it happened for her. <laughs> When's it going to happen to me? I don't want, because I know sometimes it can be hard to see people on the other side and you're aspiring to that. And I, I, I really want to share everything like you're saying to, to really provide hope. Absolutely. And you know, none, none of this comes easy. Um, you've been through, through so much uh, getting there. So yeah, every every step of your journey is really inspirational. So thank you so much, Karen. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm just gonna, uh, I'm gonna say goodbye. And uh, but please don't go anywhere. Um, I just uh, check in with you afterwards. And um, but I'm just gonna say goodbye to, and a huge big thank you to whoever is listening. And thank you for spending time with Karen and I. And wherever you're up to on your journey, um, sending you so much love. And I hope that you found some um, hope and inspiration and love and some really concrete, practical steps and tips as well that you can apply for yourself. And I'm saying huge big thank you for being part of my community and being here and for connecting. And I will see you <laughs> again very, very soon at next week's podcast. So thank you for being here and all my love and bye for now. Bye.